since I joined GitLab in 2017, our metric stack has, has really grown, and we've had to scale with that. Um, so I just wanted to give a few sort of ideas of, of how things are grown. So when I started in 2017, we'd uh, recently adopted Prometheus, and we were just about migrating off InfluxDB at the time. We had a single Prometheus server uh, for the entire environment, and there were about five infrastructure engineers in the team. Um, there were 24 alerting rules for GitLab.com. We had 10 recording rules for GitLab.com. Uh, there were about 2,000 different distinct metric names in our Prometheus stack, and about 250,000 combinations of series. Uh, we had 21 Grafana dashboards, and we had about 100,000 samples per second coming into that uh, single Prometheus server. So rolling forward three years, um, we've now been running Prometheus for over three years, and guess what? The InfluxDB servers are still running, and they haven't been shut down yet, but I've been told by Ben, who's one of our observability engineers, that it's going to be shut down in the next week. Um, we no longer run a single Prometheus. We run a federated Thanos cluster plus multiple Prometheus servers per environment. And when I last did a count, we had about 40 um, Prometheus servers or 40, 40 nodes in our, in our production um, metric stack. We no longer have an infrastructure team. We have an infrastructure department. There's about 40 people in that department, so that's six times growth. Uh, we have 280 alerting rules for GitLab.com, so that's 12 times growth. Um, 800 recording rules, 80 times. Um, 80,000 distinct different metrics in our stack, um, and those combined come out of about 5 million different series in Prometheus. And this kind of really took me by surprise, but we have 431 different Grafana dashboards, which kind of blows my mind, because that's a bit crazy. Um, and that's 20 times growth. And then every second we handle about 10 million samples into our Prometheus stack. So I think it's important to state this, like what worked well for us then, it worked fine for us at that scale, and it was the right solution at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but this approach wouldn't work for us now, and this talk is about the tools and the techniques that we've used to scale. <laughs> It's a great gift. <laughs> uh, this, this talk is about the tools and the techniques that we've used to scale from, when, from where we were then to where we are now. So the approach that we took at the time for improving and iterating on our alerting went something like this. We would experience some sort of incident or an outage, and then after we'd resolved the incident, we'd do like a post-incident review where we'd analyze what had happened um, and we'd establish a causal chain in what's sometimes known as a five whys analysis. So you go like, why, 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 why? And eventually you get to some sort of root cause. Uh, root cause, I'm going to use air quotes. Um, and then we'd comb through our metrics and we'd look for signals that match the causes that we'd built, or that we'd discovered, and we'd write alerting rules for those, for those um, causes. And the idea was that like, if we did this enough times, if we repeated the cycle over and over and over, we would capture every possible error condition in the system, and we'd have this fantastic availability as a result, and everything, nothing would ever break. The problem is that the target is always moving, right? The application is changing on a daily basis, the infrastructure is changing, third-party services are changing, the cloud provider is changing under your feet, and really, change is like the only sort of thing that, that is constant. And uh, change is also indirectly the biggest cause of incidents in the system. And it's certainly not something that we want to stop or prevent, and it's obviously not something that we can alert on. And what we found was that very often, every new incident had a new cause, and one that we hadn't accounted for. Um, and we, hadn't, we didn't have an alert for that. And so we would add a new alert to capture that new cause, and then we'd never see that alert fire again. And so it felt like we were playing this massive game of, of whack-a-mole with our infrastructure. And this wasn't the only problem we were experiencing with this strategy to alerting. So many of our alerting rules uh, inadvertently generated lots and lots of low-quality, unactionable, noisy, flappy alerts and this is just a screenshot from uh, PagerDuty, I think, of totally useless alerts that no one will ever need to respond to. 
Um, and very often what would happen would be that the engineer on call would determine that no users were being impacted by these alerts and everything seemed to be okay on the website. Uh, and they'd acknowledge in PagerDuty, um, they'd not acknowledge the alerts and then go back to bed and they'd be a little bit less rested the next day and ultimately this would lead to alert fatigue over time. And not only was the precision of our alerts very poor, but often uh, so was the recall. And so recall refers to how often significant events are captured by your, the alerting system. And unfortunately, our recall was actually quite low. So even though we had all of these alerts, we, weren't, we were missing lots of important things. And so instead of finding out about incidents through our alerting system, we were finding out about them through tweets or Slack messages or just by browsing the site and realizing that we weren't getting a very good response. Um, and sometimes they would fire, but it would be too late uh, and other people would have already noticed it. And so I find there's nothing worse than being uh, made aware of an incident by one of your users rather than your alerting system. I'd like to be the first to know about an incident, not the last. Um, and as Kwan said yesterday, he put it quite succinctly and I, I really liked his way of saying it. If, your client, if a client tells you that the application is broken, it's a fuck up. And like, I totally agree with that. I thought that was the best way to describe that. So another problem with our alerting strategy was that many of our alerting rules became technical debt over time. I call this, or I call these senescent alerts. Um, so we, Prometheus uses a tool called Alert Manager, um, and this is a very powerful approach to expressing alert conditions. So it uses a PromQL expression. Like, I don't know if you can read that. Uh, Oh, no, there's no chance. <laughs> um, but it's basically an expression. It says, if this metric is greater than this number, then do X. Um, and if the expression returns data, it will alert. Now, if it doesn't return data, there's no alert. Um, now, there's two reasons why it won't return data. The first reason is that the application is working really well, and the condition is not met because everything's working. But the second reason that it's not met is because the application's changed, and that metric no longer makes sense. It's either not being published by the application or, that, or it doesn't change in the application. Um, and basically, over time, you just build up this, accrue this technical debt of all of these alerts that can never fire. And it's a pity we can't actually read that, but this is something that is actually in our code base. And it's a, it's a check to make sure that um, if an NFS mount gets detached for a Git service, uh, we get an alert about it. And we actually removed NFS from our, from our stack about two years ago. So this alert has been sitting there for two years doing absolutely nothing. But at the same time, when you look through the alerts, you're like, ha, we have this alert, it's gonna do something, it, and it doesn't. So finally, and related to the last point, um, very often during incidents, we'd find that our dashboards were no longer working as we expected them to. And so we see something like this, where Grafana shows a bunch of panels, and there's no series in them. Now, instead of having to just diagnose the incidents, we would first have to be temporarily distracted by building a new visualization so that we could understand what's going on. And once we'd done that, we could get back to solving the actual problem. And so this isn't really ideal at all. And what, one of the things that we began to realize was that having three distinct sources of, of truth for our metric stack was part of the problem here. So we had uh, the metrics in the application, and those were independent from our alerting and recording rules. And those were independent from our dashboards. And our dashboards were in Grafana. They had no change control. They weren't checked in. And it was very difficult to validate them or check that they were actually working correctly or to search through them to find like uh, metrics that no longer existed. And so I started looking at how we could improve things and started trying to read everything that's out there. And luckily, there are some really fantastic resources um, about how to set up a reliable and scalable monitoring stack. And the first of these, which is really the, the best of these documents, was kind of where I started this, this journey, was a, was a document called My Philosophy on Alerting. Uh, if you Google it, it's a, uh, it's a Google Doc. Um, although much of that work has now ended up in a second book, uh, the SRE book uh, that Google published. And there's a chapter by Rob Iveshuk. Uh, don't know how to say his name, um, in that book, which is basically my philosophy of alerting kind of with editing. Um, 
And two other very useful documents are Brendan Gregg's USE method. So USE stands for Utilization Saturation Errors. And Tom Wilkie's RED method, um, which is more for distributed monitoring. And a RED stands for Requests, Errors, Durations. And if you're interested in this topic, I'd highly recommend reading those two uh, resources too. So with this inspiration, we set out to improve our stack um, and we had the following goals. The first was we wanted to develop a common monitoring strategy across all of our services with a set of key metrics that was common to, to every service. And then we would use those key metrics to alert, uh, to build up some alerts that would, uh, some alerts, and we'd use those, we'd, we want to have those with much higher precision, um, much higher recall, and, and much lower detection time. And then finally, we wanted to unify all of our alerts, our SLOs, our recording rules, and our dashboards into a single source, uh, and that would help us avoid inconsistencies in our metric stack going forward. Okay. So let's take a look at how we tackle the first goal of, of building a set of key metrics. So I mentioned the red method, um, but we actually based our key metrics on uh, Google's four golden signals for monitoring distributed systems. Um, and this is described in the SRE book, and I've included a link at the bottom. Is that kind of readable? Uh, <laughs> um, oh, I've, these slides will be online afterwards, and I'll provide a link, so don't have to worry about trying to, trying to read that. Um, the four signals are latency, which is how long it takes for a service to respond to requests. So latency leads to directly to user frustration, but it's also a sign that there might be other problems in your system or problems in downstream systems as well. The second signal is traffic, and this is just a measure of how many requests the service is processing per second. So it's pretty straightforward. Now, traffic on its own is fine, and heightened traffic is fine, but sometimes, if your system's not scaling correctly, it might lead to saturation and heightened error rates or, or latency. Um, the third signal is errors, and this is just a measure of how many errors are, are, uh, the system is generating uh, per second. And the fourth metric is saturation. Um, this is a measure of how close to a potential bottleneck uh, the, the system is, so how close to being full um, it is, and it's always measured as a percentage. So building on Google's four golden signals, uh, we selected our own, um, and they're very similar, but there's a few small differences in how we did things. So for latency, we measure aptX ratio rather than a direct latency measurement in seconds or milliseconds, and I'll talk a little more about this shortly. Uh, for requests, we measure them the same way. Errors um, are always measured as a percentage of total requests where lower is better. So 0% means you've got zero errors. 100% means every request is failing with an error. And saturation is measured as a percent, and lower is always better. So as I said, I'll talk a little bit more about Aptex. So Aptex is a way of measuring latency. It originates in the front-end world um, and the terminology stems from that application. Uh, but we found it works very well with inter-service applications too. The only difference between user-facing web requests and inter-service requests is that with inter-service requests, the, late, the thresholds that you use are often much shorter. Um, so for a request, uh, we measure the latency and score the request according to two thresholds. The shorts of these thresholds is known as the satisfied threshold, as in, this request took a satisfactory amount of time, um, and the longer threshold is called the tolerable threshold, as in the request was tolerable. And if the request completes faster than the satisfactory threshold, we score it as 100%. If it completes um, longer than the satisfied threshold but shorter than the tolerable threshold, we score it as 50%. And if it takes longer than the tolerable threshold, we, we give it a 0% score. And so one of the things that I really like about this approach is that you can have different requests going into one service and you can give them different thresholds that you can score. So for example, we have a service called Gitly and it does all the Git RPC um, services for, for GitLab. Um, and it, many of the requests in that service need to complete within a few milliseconds in order for the application to, to, to be healthy. But some requests can take up to 30 seconds and there's no problem, like a Git garbage collection. 
And so we can score those requests on a different threshold. So the fourth of the golden, the fourth golden signal is saturation. And this is a pretty big topic on its own, and I'm not going to go into it in much detail now. Um, if you're interested in finding out more, I did a talk in November about how we do saturation monitoring on gitlab.com, and there's a link to that talk. So let's go into the second goal of improving the quality of our alerting. So now that we're monitoring each service for its four key metrics, we can set up alerting on those four key metrics. So two of the metrics that we're measuring uh, are direct measures of user experience, the app deck score and the error rate. So when the app deck drops, users are experiencing poor latency, poor performance, and when the error rate spikes, we know that they're getting more errors than, than normal. And so we call these symptom-based alerts because we're alerting on the symptom of the problem, but not the cause. And the symptom is a bad user experience. When these alerts fire, we know by definition that users are being, are, are, are being impacted by the problem, um, and therefore the problem is serious enough to wake somebody on call and send out a pager duty to, to that person. Um, we can define service level objectives for this. So for Aptex, we could say that the Aptex score for a service has to be above like 99.99%, and for error rate, we can say that the error rate has to be um, below 0.001%. And if it exceeds those thresholds, then we need to wake somebody up if necessary. Now the downside to this symptom-based alerting is that we're alerting on a symptom and not the cause. And so it's always up to the engineer to investigate the symptom and understand what the cause is. Um, just this, uh, these graphs I took, we had a, a little incident um, about two weekends ago, and these graphs are kind of really uh, great examples of, of how you can see things going wrong really quickly. Um, I've also included a link at the bottom to those graphs because all of our Grafana dashboards are public, so if you want to go see the stuff, that, that link will take you to the dashboard at the time when we had the incident. Um, so alongside the two symptom-based alerts, we also have two cause-based alerts, um, and these are for anomalies in our request rate. So we use statistical techniques to figure out what the request rate uh, for a service is at this time of day, this time of the week, uh, with, within a certain standard deviation. And if the request rate jumps out of that very far, we'll get an alert on that. And we also measure the saturation, and if saturation gets uh, really high, we'll alert on that. Um, but these are cause-based alerts. So just because traffic is spiking doesn't mean that users are having a bad experience. Um, and, and likewise, saturation could be very high, but no users are being impacted. Um, so it's only if the service doesn't scale properly, if, it, if it's not scaling up properly and users start seeing uh, like a bad experience, that, that it becomes a, a symptom um, in that case. And, th and in that case, we need to wake an engineer. But just because we've got 10 times the amount of traffic, that on its own is not really a reason to, to wake somebody up. So the first approach that we used for SLO alerting was a pretty simple um, approach. And if the error rate or the aptX score for service is outside of its SLO for five consecutive minutes, then we send out an alert. And with Prometheus, this is very easy to do. Um, and you can use a single rule for error rates and a single rule for aptX rate, rates. And you can apply these two rules across any number of services in your application. Um, the problem with this approach is that it's not as reliable or as effective as we'd like it to be. It's still very much better than using cause-based alerts um, in both precision and recall, but the condition, uh, there are many conditions in which it fails. And these are three examples. I call them the double dipper, the lurker, and the flappy bird. And as far as I know, these are not industry standard terms. Uh, <laughs> um, so in the double dipper, what happens is that an error happens but the metric dips above and below the SLO. So you don't get that consecutive five minute period. Um, and so it might be quite a long time before, before the error alerts. Or even worse, it, it might not ever 
um, fire. Um, with the lurker, there's clearly an error happening, but it's just below the, the threshold of your SLO, so you don't get, it doesn't uh, fire either. Clearly something's wrong there, but, but nobody knows about it. This is also called a slow burn error. And the flappy bird, to me, is like the worst of all three of these. This is when uh, an error happens, it fires for five consecutive minutes, it drops down, and then it fires again. And so you get this, this situation where you just keep getting um, alerts over and over. So you're trying to investigate a problem, and your pager is just pinging you nonstop, and you can't concentrate. Um, and so there's this very good solution uh, which addresses all three of these conditions and more. And we're currently rolling it out on gitlab.com, and it's been working really, really well. Um, it's quite technical, very technical, and I'm not going to go into the gory details in this talk, but if you're interested in knowing more, Google have published a second book called the SRE Workbook, um, and this describes this approach, and I've included a link. I don't know, yeah, you can see that one. Uh, I've included a link in the slide. The concept is that um, you have an SLO and you monitor it over different burn rates. So you know what your error budget is over a month. And so you can say, if I'm burning my error budget at 10% uh, an hour, I'm not going to make it through a month on this, on this error budget. And so you use multiple burn rates to monitor for errors. Um, and the net result is an alerting framework with very high precision and very low detection time and excellent recall. Um, the problem with this approach is the amount of complexity it brings. So for each service we need to monitor, we need five burn rates for error and five burn rates for app decks, which is um, 20 or uh, 10, 10 different recording rules. And if you scale that up across your service, you end up having hundreds and hundreds of these very similar but slightly different uh, recording rules. And it's very easy to make mistakes. Um, so this approach has been working really, really well for us on gitlab.com, but it really highlights the need for us to manage all of this complexity. Um, and doing this, would be, doing this manually would be really, really painful. So um, that brings us on to the, the third goal. Um, and that is, so in the beginning, we were managing these rules manually, um, but we began to realize that we had a huge amount of repetition in what we're doing. So for each service, we ended up with about 20 different Prometheus queries. And many of them were very similar, but not exactly the same. And then we would take those queries and we'd put them into a Grafana dashboard. And in Grafana, they would also be similar, but not the same. They probably have different aggregations in, in Grafana. And when we needed to change a query or change the, the way that we monitor the service, it was very error prone. And you could miss one rule and break your monitoring. Um, and so we're also trying to encourage the development teams to, to self-service on, on this monitoring, but trying to get them to do all of this was, was far too complex, like nobody was interested in, in, in doing that. Uh, and so we started thinking about like, what tools we could use to, to improve this process and make it easier. And the inspiration we took was from static site generators. And um, with the static site generator, you have your content in a simple format, say Markdown, and you use that to generate reams and reams of HTML and search indexes and RSS feeds and everything else. But what you start with is a very simple format. Um, in the same way that people don't generate uh, or don't write HTML by hand very often anymore, we decided that maybe it was time we started generating our Prometheus recording rules. Um, and so we started thinking about what kind of model we could use to do this. And we decided it would be called the metrics catalog. So the two main languages that we use at GitLab are Go and Ruby. Um, and so we started off with considering those. They're both totally adequate, and we could have used the templating that both languages have, uh, and we could have done it that way. But around about this time, we became aware of a third option called JSONnet. So can I just ask for a show of hands of who's heard of JSONnet? OK, wow. And, and used it? OK. <laughs> so JSONnet is a, is a language, and it's designed specifically for generating config data. It's, run, it's a project run by Google, um, and it's an extension to JSON, but you can use it to generate uh, YAML or INI files or anything like that. It doesn't really matter the output format. Um, it's a, it's, technically, it's quite a, a scratchy beard language. Um, it's pure, lazy, functional. 
Um, and it has a very interesting property that it's hermetic. And so the same source code will always generate the same outputs um, every time. So it has no like file IO or read, read IO, for example. But the easiest way to think about it is JSON with imports and comments and for loops and, and functions. So the idea was that we would describe all of our metrics in this catalog, and this would be an abstract configuration that we could use to, uh, to, to, to generate our metrics, and we'd store that in, in JSON it. Uh, the whole project would be stored in a, in a Git repository. We would use Git for uh, change control, and we could use merge requests, and those merge requests could be reviewed. When something hit master, we could use that to generate all of our configurations from scratch and hopefully also generates all of our Grafana dashboards. So this is what a typical entry in the, in the metrics catalog looks like. Um, we have um, the SLOs at the top, so you can see there we've got an error ratio of uh, 0.9999, which is 99.99%. Um, then we define um, the app decks, the satisfactory threshold, the tolerable threshold, and the, um, the, the, the metric name that we're gonna use that for that. We define how we'll, fetch, how we'll generate the request rate and the error rate. Mm, yeah, and so that's, that's kind of this abstract definition. So we have functions for app decks, we have a function for um, uh, request, and those functions will go and generate all the recording rules that we need. And, and all the different queries that we need also for Grafana. So we then generate, we run that JSON script, and that emits Prometheus recording rules. And as you can see, these are the, the type of recording rules that it generates. They're all very similar, but they have slight differences. So this is, is generating burn rates for five minutes, 30 minutes, and, and six hours. And so it's just creating a rate, an aggregation, which is a pretty standard Prometheus uh, query. Um, and very, very straightforward. And in some cases, we also want to generate multiple um, aggregations. So some of our services, like the Giddly service that I mentioned earlier, the performance of every backend uh, node is important, and so we generate um, SLO metrics per node in the, in the fleet. And, and so these queries are, again, very similar, but we have a different aggregation, which is we're aggregating per service, and in the second case, we're aggregating per node. So we end up with this matrix of, of different burn rates and different aggregations, um, all very similar but slightly different. So let's talk about generating Grafana dashboards. So as it happens, the Grafana team have created a JSON library called Grafonet, uh, and we use that to build our dashboard. We could use that to build our dashboards and we, what we wanted to do was build a dashboard for each service and then publish them in Grafana through Grafana's REST API. So this is a typical example of the kind of dashboard that we're generating now using our metrics catalog. Um, one of the things that I really like about this approach is that every dashboard has a similar layout. So when you go to the web service or the API service or the Giddly service, the first row along the top is our four key metrics. So we have um, app decks, error ratios, traffic with the um, anomaly sort of range, and then saturation on the end. And the, the rows are consistent. So when you open up a dashboard during an incident and time is critical, you can very quickly find the information that you need from, from the dashboard. Um, the other thing about using this approach is that all of our dashboards are very consistent. So we have the same scaling, we have the same color schemes, everything is, is very consistent across these dashboards. Um, this is, some of them have started getting quite colorful. Uh, this is uh, for background jobs, and at the top we also include information about the urgency of a job, um, you know, what feature it's associated with so we know who to get in touch with in the business if things are going wrong, um, a whole bunch of other information, and all of this is generated for, uh, using Grafonet. And uh, this is just another dashboard, similar details. Um, cool. 
And then I just wanted to kind of show some of the other features that is kind of difficult to demo, um, but what I'm really proud of. Um, the first is that because we're generating these dashboards, we can put all sorts of cool features in. One of them is that we use a feature in Grafana called Data Links. And when you click on a series, it gives you a menu of, of options. And one of the options that we can give people is show us the same data in a visualization in Kibana. So Kibana has a query, a URL query in a, in a language called Ryzen. Like I think they're the only company in the world, uh, uh, looking at the Elastic guys at the back now, I think Elastic are the only guys in the world that use this Ryzen data format but I managed to get um, JSONnet to generate Ryzen. So we can generate queries into Elasticsearch with the data that we're looking at in Kibana. So you know, we'll be looking at a graph and we'll be needing to understand in more detail why we're seeing a particular latency spike. And we can click on that series and open up the dashboard in, our, in Kibana with a pre-configured um, uh, visualization. And this is really useful during abuse uh, situations where we need to find if there's a particular user who's, who's doing something bad. Um, the second thing that we do is we generate all sorts of information and put them into little um, uh, uh, tooltips in Grafana. So that second example shows, uh, we show the AppDex scores, the AppDex thresholds that we use to generate an AppDex score. So people can say, well, the AppDex threshold is one second or half a second, and that can help them understand what's going on there. And then the third, uh, type of panel that I put in in the last week is, uh, is this mermaid diagram. And because we have a, a network, we understand the dependencies between the services, and that's something that we keep in the metrics catalog, we can generate uh, mermaid. Who's used mermaid before? Yeah, it's like, a, it's like a markdown for diagrams. It's a very simple, it's a bit like uh, dots or graphers or something like that. And so we can generate these diagrams from our, our dependencies, and there's a really nice little plugin for Grafana called Diagram Plugin, and you can color code the elements in the diagram with error rates. So in this example over there, we were having uh, latency issues on our web service, and taking a look at it, we could see that we were having latency issues on our Redis cache immediately. It was just, it obviously stood out um, that that's where the issue was, and we could, we could very quickly navigate to the source of a problem. So I'm really happy with that. So in conclusion, uh, this is the five points I guess I want to take away. This is how we deal with metrics at, uh, at scale on gitlab.com. Um, we define a set of key metrics for each service. Uh, we focus on symptom-based alerting uh, when possible rather than cause-based alerting. I think it's worth pointing out though as well that you will always have cause-based alerts but really, strategically, you should be focusing on those, on those symptom-based alerts. Um, we built a metrics catalog as a single source of truth for all of our metrics, and we're migrating to multi-window, multi-burn rate SLO alerting and seeing very good results from that. Um, and then finally, we moved to generating our dashboards in uh, Grafonet. So, as I mentioned, if you scan that QR code, you should get the slides if you, if you want to get to any links. Uh, all the code for, uh, that, that I've been talking about is available at that repository. Um, and if you're interested in this sort of thing, obviously GitLab is hiring, so get in touch with me and I can tell you more. Uh, we have a scalability team and we will soon be starting a second scalability team. Um, and that's it. Does everyone have any questions? Great. I've got the mic there at the back. Hey, uh, I just want to find out uh, when it comes to calculating your app decks. Uh, yes. Are you including errors as? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a very good question. We don't. So initially I did, but I kind of found that it was better to have those two things on two dimensions. So AppDex is purely um, uh, latency. We do count, if a, if a status comes back as, as in error, 
and it takes like say a unicorn timeout is 50 seconds and so it basically hangs and sits there for 50 seconds we do include that in the app dex score and it's obviously at the end of the 50 seconds it times out with a 500 um, we do include that in the app dex score but we don't if say something comes back in like one millisecond with a 500 um, we do include that as part of the app dex if that makes sense yes it does um but also, I just wanted to know, uh, shit, now I lost my thought. <laughs> uh, fuck it, I'll ask you later. <laughs> yeah, come, come find me, I'll, I'll be happy to help. Question of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your talk. Uh, can you say more about how the dependencies were generated? So if you have multiple services calling other services, I'm, I'm curious. How do you understand the dependency chain? So it's in that metrics catalog, I, I chopped it out because I didn't have space. But at the moment, it's, it's pretty like agricultural. We just have a section which is uh, dependencies. And it lists the, the first, you know, the direct dependencies. And then because JSON it is a really elegant language that you can do nice little recursive queries very easily. Um, we just basically figure out what the chain of, of the entire chain of dependencies is and then and then use that um, It's pretty early days for that like I would like to um, Include in that prioritization on on alerting So if we get an alert from the web service to say it's slow and at the same time we get an alert from the Redis cache to say it's slow, you know, we sort of prioritize the Redis alert over the over the web alert because that's kind of going to be the, the the root cause of that problem but at the moment, it's, it's a static list that's included in the, in the metrics catalog. Um, you know, in future, we are kind of rolling out distributed tracing very slowly on gitlab.com. And maybe there's a way that we could include that data to actually get a full service list. Um, the one thing I'll say is that GitLab is still very much a monolith with sort of pieces around the monolith. And then we deploy the monolith in different ways. So we, we have the monolith running as web, the same monolith running as API, and we treat those as two separate services because the workloads are very different. So all in all, we don't have uh, thousands of services. It's not, a, it's not a major undertaking to keep that maintained. Cool. Okay. Uh, thanks, very interesting talk. Um, particularly interested in the idea that you only wake people up for symptom-based uh, problems. Do you ever find that actually one of your causal uh, monitoring would have told you that something was maybe starting to run out of memory and you only actually get woken up once there's a problem and you would have preferred to be woken up before the problem became a problem? Uh, yeah, so with that, that, that other talk that I did about the um, saturation, um, the, the, the talk that I mentioned about, about monitoring sa saturation in gitlab.com, goes very much into that. And so we have a very different way of dealing with saturation where um, we look at trends in, the, so in, in all of our saturation. So we, we treat memory as a saturation metric. We treat the number of sidekick workers that are available to do work. Sidekick's a background processing um, thing that we use. We treat that as a, as a saturation metric. And they're all just metrics and then we over time, we, we look at the statistics, uh, we use statistics and, and standard deviations to guess where that's gonna end up. Um, and that's kind of a different thing. But what we try to do with that is figure out well in advance. So we, we project forward about two weeks on our saturation capacity planning dashboard. Um, and so we try to fix those when people are awake and during the week um, to some, some success. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, I love the fact of GitLab's openness, like it feels like as a culture you want to make everything public that you can, yeah. um, and Grafana dashboards being part of that, um, but every time I look at your Grafana dashboards, I think if I wanted to DDoS a site, yeah. like how awesome to do it to a site where you can literally see what you're doing, <laughs> um, and have you ever felt that that's happened to you guys, like have you... Like, well, I mean, that's... that's um graph that I that I mentioned the link of where the, the the examples that I was using from Grafana where all everything was out of SLO that was a DDoS um, 
But like, I don't think that the people that are DDoSing us are kind of like that bothered about that. They just kind of mostly want to like mine Bitcoin or um, publish uh, adverts for football, you know, South American football sites or whatever. They're not really sort of like looking at the dashboard and then figuring out. The other thing to keep in mind is that you can download the source code for, for GitLab and what we run on GitLab.com is exactly the same, literally exactly the same code base as, 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 as what's running in self-managed. And you can find a, like a very sort of sensitive piece of code that, that has a very expensive, you know, ON squared or whatever, and you can, you can do that. So I, I don't think that the dashboards on their own are, are sufficient. Um, or, you know, there's, there's easier ways to kind of find, find weak points. Um, thanks for the talk. I, I kind of have two questions. The first one was about you wanting to go to a single source of truth for your dashboards and your alerting and that sort of stuff. But you still seem to have your Prometheus, your, you know, your Prometheus metrics and stuff being created in one repo and your Grafana dashboards being done separately. No, they're all in the same, they're, they're all in this repository. Oh, they're all together. So, but the, the, the only difference is that um, the, when, that, when we merge to master, it will run a script and that will generate the Grafana dashboards and push them through the, uh, the Grafana REST API. So somebody could then go and like edit it in Grafana. We, we, we make them read only in Grafana, but technically you could edit it. But then the next time someone merges to master, that'll be overwritten again. Okay, cool. And then the other question was about alerting. I saw a lot of your Grafana dashboards. You had dash, uh, Grafana alerting configured as well. Do you use both Alert Manager and Grafana? Uh, no, we only, use, we only use Prometheus alerting. So that's, um, we only use the, the Prometheus alerting, just keeping things simple. Okay, thank you. Cool. <laughs> Sorry. Um, with regards to like all the um, improvements you guys made in the metrics, did you guys ever include things like deployment markers so yes. that you could we, get some alerting or, uh, we, and, and sorry, just to follow on on that one, um, after the, like if you do have the markers, um, do you guys have like a cool off period um, to, you know, get some more metrics in so you can identify issues during deployments? So we don't, we don't have a cool off period yet, but that's not a bad idea. Um, like we do, we, I mean, because it's a, a dot .com site, you know, whether or not we've deployed the SLO should be met, right? Like, and if, and if it's not being met, uh, then there's a problem. One of the things that we've added recently, which I'm quite happy about, is we have uh, a label that, that tells you whether a certain deployment is canary or production. And we actually look and see if, if canary is going south, but production, the main production stage is, is good, then we, we raise like a very high severity alert. Like, hey, it looks like the canary is bad like stop, stop the continued rollouts of it. Um, and that works pretty well. But we, like for the production stage, you know, we're trying to get to a point where we, we're rolling out very frequently. And so we don't want to have like decreased SLO during that period. Like we'd rather make sure that our load balances are, are really good um, and, and, you know, users don't experience any, any hiccups during a deployment. Um, yeah, the, the, we, we have, uh, annotations for, for deployments, and then recently we also added annotations for feature flags being toggled, and that's super useful because often what will happen is someone will toggle a feature flag and um, everything will go south and we'll be like, what's happened? Um, so yeah. Okay, got one at the back. One at the back, one at the front, and then we'll take a break. No? Uh, thanks for the thanks for the talk. You you spoke as one of your about one of your problems being that customers were telling you about things being down or slow, etc. Yeah, you can see how you know what you've spoken about has solved the noisy alerts and, and waking guys up. Yeah, how's it gone on the customers getting the tweet in before your alerting? Uh, I think it's it, it's got much better. The one part that we don't have is, is automated. So we use a, a, a status.io for doing this, the status page. And we still manually update status.io. And so what will often happen is we'll get the alert. Um, and then we'll be kind of like 
focusing on the alert, and no one will remember to go and update status.io. So uh, actually, on the wake of that 22nd of February incident, uh, one of the corrective actions was to automate status.io. And that automation would totally, I mean, if, if I've got anything to do with it, it'll totally be based on the SLO alerts. So when you go below SLO, we'll, we'll change it on there. Uh, and then hopefully people will know that we know, where sometimes we kind of drop the ball on, on letting people know, like right at the beginning. Yeah. Great. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thank you.